Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on Legends of the Early Republic. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to find out what happens after the last king of Rome, Tarquin the Proud, is overthrown by the senators of the Early Republic. So let's take a look. We're going to start by setting the scene, figure out how we got to this place. I'll give you a hint, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Then we're going to figure out the structure of this early republic. How is it set up? Who has the power? Why do they have it that way? And then we'll get into some of these kind of early mytho-historical characters of the early republic, where kind of we, we get this um, narrative of these very powerful, very influential individuals that maybe kind of sort of actually existed, but we don't know for sure. And we're going to see how they reveal uh, what it means to be a good Roman. And then finally, we'll wrap up with some concluding thoughts. So how did we get here? It all starts way back before Rome was even a city in the early Iron Age. And that's where we get these kind of different tribes all over the Italian peninsula, the kind of strongest and most complex of those being the Etruscans. And even though the Etruscans were powerful early on, the Romans end up founding the city. Romulus founds the city of Rome in 753 BC. And for about 250 years, there's a series of seven kings that kind of each contribute something to the city and culture of Rome. Now, like I was saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that happens here as well. So even though the early kings, right, Romulus, the warrior, and Numa, the kind of religious priest, are contributing what it means to be a good Roman, eventually we get to the point where that kind of single uh, monarchic power is too much for one person, and we get the king uh, Tarquin the Proud, or Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, uh, and his family, Sextus Tarquinius, his son, abusing that power. So Tarquin's putting people to death, his son is having his way with senators' wives, and this eventually ends up being too much. And then those senatorial families overthrow the king, kick him out of the city of Rome, and usher in the Roman Republic in about 509 BC. Now, if that date looks a little bit familiar to you, all right, it's possibly because this is right around the same time that the Athenians adopted democracy. And one of the things that we think is that when later Roman authors were constructing their histories about when Rome switched from a monarchy to a republic, they wanted to put that about one year earlier than the Athenians invented, invented democracy, right? So they wanted to say, hey, well, sure, you had democracy, but even earlier than that, we started republicanism. And so it's unclear whether that's the actual historical date of this change, or rather the later Roman historians trying to make a point. So let's talk a little bit about what this means, what it means to be a republic. So with the expulsion of Tarquin the Proud, we get two key characters. We get Lucius Junius Brutus over here on the left, and we get Lucius Tarquinius Colatinus over here on the, on the right. And we'll remember that it's Colatinus' wife, Lucretia, who was raped by the son of the king and who ultimately killed herself, that sparked this rebellion. And so what they do is they kick Tarquin out of the city of Rome. He doesn't get killed, but they kick him out of Rome, and they establish a new form of government. Now, that new form of government is called the Republic. And if there's one thing to remember about the Republic, right, if there's one kind of key ideology of the Republic, it's that there are no more kings. No single rule in the city of Rome. Power has got to be shared amongst the people. That's the key ideology. No more kings. And for 500 years, this is going to be the prevailing ideology of the Romans. So, how is this actually structured then? How is the Republic structured? Well, when we talk about Greek democracy, the idea is that everybody participates, right? When you vote on something, everybody gets into a room and raises their hand as to whether they want to do something or not, okay? Should we go to war with Sparta? Yes? No. Should we raise taxes? Yes? No. Things are very different in Rome. So rather than directly voting on the issues, very often what's going on in Rome is that the people are voting on representatives, and it's those representatives who then make the laws. 
And at the top of that kind of political chain is the office of consul. This is kind of the executive branch of the ancient Romans. And with the consuls, there are always two of them, right? That's how they get around this idea of having one person have too much power. There are always two consuls, and they always only rule for one year at a time. And the thinking there, right, is that the second consul will balance out the first if the first is a little bit crazy. And if they're both kind of crazy, it's all right. They only have power for a year, and then they're out of there. And we move down the chain. This is actually known as something as the cursus honorum. This is the, work, the way you kind of work your way up in politics in ancient Rome. And then after you kind of graduate, you move over to the Senate. And we'll talk about that later. But basically, the Senate is an advisory body, kind of without legislative power, but very uh, kind of influential in terms of their guidance. So at the kind of bottom of that chain, we get the plebeians. The plebeians are kind of the regular people of Rome. And they're contrasted, of course, with the patricians. So you can get the, think of this as kind of the, the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. The plebeians are the regular people, the 99%. The patricians, and their word, right, uh, patrician, comes from patres, meaning fathers. So it's their kind of ancestors who are around at the founding of the city of Rome. And so the patricians are kind of that 1% at the top. And of course, the patricians are trying to, um, they're trying to keep as much power as they can for themselves. And the plebeians are trying to get some of that power back for their group, right? So it's this constant struggle. And the plebeians come up with a really interesting strategy for doing this. Basically, as things evolve, as Rome starts fighting larger and larger wars, what the plebeians end up doing is in the middle of the war, they take all their people and they leave. They stop fighting and they go on top of a hill, the Monte Sacra or the Mons Sacra, the sacred mountain. And they just sit there and they say, all right, patricians, you fight the war yourself. Now, there are way more plebeians than there are patricians. So this is really devastating for the Romans at this point in time. And it turns out that the plebeians are actually able to win a certain number of rights. And we call this kind of this kind of back and forth between the patricians and the plebeians early on. We call that the conflict of orders. So it's kind of amazingly the, the plebeians are able to win a good amount of rights. They're able to get a political office for themselves. That's known as the tribunate, right? So they can elect a tribune. And the tribune has two really important things. The first thing is that they're sacrosanct. Nobody can lay a finger on a tribune. The second thing is that they have the power of veto. So while they don't have quite as much power in terms of making laws, at least early on, what they can do is veto any of the laws that are made by kind of those higher up consuls. The second thing that they're able to get is codified law. And there, we call this in ancient Rome, we call it the 12 tables, right? So these laws written down on 12 bronze tablets, okay? And this is really important because when we're, we're thinking of the ancient world, prior to codified law, if something happens or somebody's wronged, right? You basically have to take their word or you have to kind of go after their family. There's no written rule. And so by putting this, onto bronze tablets, that means everybody now has to play by the same rules. Whereas before, the patricians could kind of get off with just saying, hey, we're the rich people, we're in power. Now, all of a sudden, they have to play by the same rules as everybody else. So those are some of the major developments of the early republic, right? The struggle between rich and poor, the plebeians eventually able to kind of gain some power with the tribunes and with the 12 tables, and then also the structuring of the government with the consuls at the top and eventually, after you make your way through the consulate, you move over to the Senate. Uh, and those kind of positions slowly become more and more uh, achievable by different rungs of the socioeconomic spectrum. So let's take a look at now at some of the big players from the early republic. And again, the idea is that the people we're talking about are kind of maybe actual people. It's people hundreds of years later who are writing their stories. And so it's tough to tell whether A, they were actual people, or B, maybe they were actual people, but they didn't do exactly what we have here, or C, maybe it did actually play out more or less the way they're telling the story. What we do know, and what I want you to think about as we go through these stories, is that these stories are not just history for the sake of history. They're meant to convey a message about what it means to be a Roman.
At the end of the monarchy, right, Tarquin escapes. He's not killed by Brutus and Colatinus. He escapes and he runs back to where his family's from, and that's Etruria, right? Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, it's an Etruscan name, somebody from the, the city of Tarquinia, and he's able to get back to Etruria, where one of the kings, the king of Clusium, is Lars Porsena, and he's one of the Etruscan kings that's closest to the city of Rome. Now, Lars Porsena decides to march on the city of Rome, and we don't exactly know why this is. We think maybe it's to reinstall one of the Etruscans as the king. We also think that maybe he just wanted to take the city for himself. We also think maybe he just wanted to burn it to the ground and take all the good stuff Rome had. Anyway, he marches on the city, and where he ends up is on the west side of the Tiber River. So if we kind of looked at a map of where Rome is and where the Etruscans are, the Etruscans are all on the west side of the river, and the city of Rome at this point in time is all on the right side of the river. And the only thing that connects them is what's known as the Sublician Bridge, right here. So there's one bridge that goes across and connects Rome on the east side of the Tiber to the Etruscan territory on the west side of the Tiber. So when the Etruscans attack at this point in time, they're still far stronger than the Romans. So this is one of the weird things. It's not like the Etruscan culture had died out by the time Rome kind of arose. No, Etruria, right? The Etruscans were still really, really strong. They bring their army down, and they're set up right on the other side of the Sublician Bridge. Now, Rome is kind of freaking out at this point because they know they can't put up a fight against the strong Etruscan army. And this is where we get our first hero arise, a guy by the wonderful name of Horatius Cocles, right? So Horatius Cocles says to his Roman troops, they were defending the bridge, and he says, if we all do this, we're going to die here. The only hope that Rome has is to get rid of the bridge and prevent the Etruscans from crossing. Now, it's going to take time to do this. And so what Horatius Cocles says, right, what he does is he says, I will stand here and fight. I'm going to hold them off. You guys get to the other side of the bridge, right, and destroy the bridge as you go. Leave me on this side. I'll figure out a way. And so Horatius Cocles fights the Etruscans, keeps them at bay, while his Roman countrymen are destroying the bridge behind them. And then what ends up happening at the kind of end of the story? Well, there are a couple different endings. In one ending, right, he ends up dying the hero's death. So he's, pre he's prevented the city of Rome from being sacked, but then he's end up killed by the Etruscans. In another ending, however, he actually, his last move after the bridge has been totally destroyed, in his full armor, he dives into the Tiber River and he kind of prays to the god of the river on his way in. And the god saves him, right? The god takes care of him because of his heroic deeds and because of his prayer, and Horatius Cocles ends up okay. Now, even though he was so heroic here, right, he hasn't defeated the Etruscan army. They're still there, there's just no bridge anymore. And that's where our second hero comes in, a guy by the name of Mucius Scaevola, the courageous assassin. Now, Rome has decided that the best way to take care of the Etruscans, because they, they don't have like kind of the army to defeat them in pitched battle, is to basically kill the snake by cutting off the head, assassinating Lars Porsena, the Etruscan king. And so they send an assassin, Mucius Scaevola, and he infiltrates the Etruscan camp. And he does a really good job. He gets all the way into the center of the camp, and he's got his knife, and he's ready to go through with the assassination, and he does. The only problem is that the guy that he's assassinated is not the king. He mistook the king's bodyguard for the king himself. So now he's killed like the king's right-hand man, and the, 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 kind of, the jig is up, right? Uh, and they recognize him as an assassin. And so Lars Porsena pulls him in front of him, and he says, what's going on, Mucius Scaevola? And Mucius Scaevola, he says that he is one of 300 Romans who have sworn to every one of them do exactly what he's doing, to infiltrate the camp and assassinate the king. So there are 299 more guys right behind him. And as a show of bravery, what he does with his, his kind of sword still in hand, he puts his hand into the fire that was right next to, uh, to Lars Porsena, the Etruscan king. And he's sitting there, 
telling him that there are 299 more Romans who are going to do this, while his hand is literally burning off, right? So again, kind of highlighting the, uh, the courage and the endurance of pain, what it means to, to be a good Roman here. So, Lars Porsena basically says at that point, these guys are crazy, right? I do not want to have to deal with 299 more of these guys. And he turns around and leaves. Now, this is what the, the kind of legend says. We actually have archaeological evidence from around this time, right, from around the early Republic, that says that the Etruscans probably did take over and burn the city of Rome right around 500 BC. And so even though the kind of mytho, mytho, mythological story about Scaevola is, is very appealing, it looks like Porsena, or whoever the Etruscan king was, was able to get inside the city walls. He didn't stick around them. Now, as Rome continues to grow and they were able to fight off the Etruscans for just a little bit, they're able to consolidate power in the kind of region of the Latin tribes. So remember that Italy is filled with a bunch of different tribes, the Etruscans and the Sabines and the Iqui, uh, and the Umbro Sabellians over here and the Samnites down here. And Rome is very, very slowly able to take over uh, with a series of kind of um, Latin tribes, right? They're, be able to come the, they're able to become the first among equals there. So they put together what, what they call the Latin League and the idea here is to defend against outsiders like the Etruscans. But Rome's not just the equal of, an, of another individual kind of city-state here. It turns out that Rome gets to control all the armies, right? They're providing as many troops as the rest of the towns uh, combined. They can call the army to war whenever they want to. And so what we see is even though they're kind of like one of many city-states in this league, already they're kind of starting to establish dominance over their neighbors. Now, after the Latin League's been formed, Rome's still dealing with issues with neighboring tribes, and we can kind of see the scale of it here, right? So the Latins are right here in red, and right now Rome's being besieged by the Iqui, all right? So just here, a little bit to the northeast of Rome. And the Iqui's having a lot of success. They've basically, um, they've, they've pushed in right to the walls of Rome, and Rome is in a huge panic. And so what Rome does is they set up a dictatorship. Now, this sounds really bad in terms of kind of the way we use dictator in the modern sense, but dictator was actually a position within the ancient Roman government. It wasn't like somebody was elected dictator and there was always a dictator. It was simply in times of emergency, the Romans could appoint a single person to have sole authority. And this was useful because you could make decisions really, really quickly, right? Rather than have two consuls try to battle it out and have people voting on everything. Now, all of a sudden, one dictator can make things happen. And so in this time of crisis, what they do is they go get a guy by the name of Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus. Now, Cincinnatus used to be a consul, but since then, he's retired and he's become a farmer. And they say, Cincinnatus, we need you. We need you to lead the troops. We need you to get us out of this jam. And so he leaves his plow in the field, and he goes back into the city of Rome, and he gets the troops together. And now normally when the Romans would kind of get their troops together and build a fort, they'd bring a few pieces of wood. But now he's asking the men to, build, uh, to bring 12 times as many pieces of wood as they normally would. And what he ends up doing is at night he ends up encircling the Iqui. And he basically builds kind of a wall around them, trapping them on the inside with the Romans on the outside. And now kind of they're, they're trapped. They can't go anywhere. And eventually he's able to get the surrender of the, uh, the Iqui tribe. And he makes them um, kind of walk out under very not so good conditions. And somehow he's been able to do this in about two short weeks, very, very quickly. Now the position of dictator was appointed for six months. So he has about five and a half more months where he could have sole control of Rome. But the reason that Cincinnatus is, uh, is kind of known as one of these heroes or legends of the early Republic is because he doesn't do that. As soon as, soon as he's vanquished the foe, Cincinnatus gives up political power and he heads back to the field, back to the plow that he left about two weeks earlier, and he goes back to being a farmer. And you can kind of see how this represents exactly what a Roman citizen is supposed to be. Somebody who rises to the call, right? Rises to the challenge when they're called to. And yet afterwards, 
goes back, doesn't worry about prestige, doesn't worry about um, kind of being the best in, in office, they go back to their farm and become a citizen the way they're supposed to be. Now, about 50 years after that, Rome is really in a, a, a tight spot. We get the Gauls, we get these Celts coming down basically almost over the Alps from way in the north of Italy. And the Gauls are going to be a problem for the Romans for a long, long time to, uh, long, long time to come. Like 400 years later, Julius Caesar's still dealing with these guys. But at this point in time, the Gauls are the kind of biggest challenge the Romans have faced thus far. And they make it all the way down to Rome, they set up shop, and they're able to break down the city walls and make it inside the city. Now, the Romans, they end up camping out on the Capitoline Hill. Remember, that's where the, two, uh, the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus is. And the, uh, the Gauls can't make it up there, right? It's like too steep. And so they're trying to starve them out. But now every time they try to scale the wall, right, the Romans are like not having any beans starved out. They're like throwing bread down, right? They're last of their food. They're throwing it down at the Gauls, trying to get them to stop scaling the wall. So one night, the Gauls decide that in the middle of the night, right, what they're going to try to do is build this human pyramid up the wall. And what ends up happening is that they wake up a, a geese, right, a goose, uh, while doing this. And the goose starts squawking. And the squawking wakes up one of the Roman heroes, a guy by the name of Marcus Manlius. And so Marcus Manlius rushes over to the walls hearing this goose. Uh, the animal associated with the, the goddess Juno. And he's basically able to tip over this human pyramid, and the Gauls go crashing to the ground. And once down on the ground, the Romans rush out and they start slaughtering them. And so, like, kind of in this sense, once again, we get Marcus Manlius, uh, and I guess the goose, as one of the heroes of the, uh, the early Republic. So we get hero after hero after hero, right, exemplifying what it means to be a good, courageous Roman uh, in those days. And yet, things aren't perfect for Rome. So we saw actually there, the Gauls are inside the walls of Rome. Rome's camped out just on one of the little hills there. And it turns out, the Gauls burn the city at this point in time. So 390 BC, the Gauls move in, led by their general Brennus, and they basically um, take over Rome. Now, they don't have any interest in staying, but they do have interest in money. And so they call the Romans down, and they organize kind of a, um, a ransom, okay? So they say, we'll leave, but we want a thousand talents of gold. And a talent is, is a kind of a weight measure, right? But we want a bunch of pounds. We want hundreds of pounds of gold. And so Brennus brings out the scales, right? The kind of scales that go like this. And he puts a thousand pounds on one side, and then the Romans are supposed to put the gold on the other side. And during this process, the Romans like, are, are thinking that these scales aren't quite right. Like they're, they're rigged in favor of the Gauls, right? Like it's, it's actually taking way more than a thousand pounds to equal this thing out. And so they start complaining about this. And Brennus looks at them, and in their own Latin language, he says, Vai victis, woe to the conquered. And after saying this, he takes his sword and he throws it on the other side, right? saying, we're the winners. We can, we can make you pay whatever we want. Um, and it's woe to the conquered here. You're going to pay whatever we say. We don't have to be fair to you. So despite all these kind of legendary heroes, Rome's in a little bit of a rough spot. So let's wrap up with a couple thoughts here. So first of all, Rome starts out really, really small. And in those early days, right, even after overthrowing the monarchy, they're still kind of not as powerful as some of their neighbors. The Etruscans are still a little bit more powerful. The Gauls are still a little bit more powerful. They are able to establish a sort of kind of dominance over the other Latin tribe or the other Latin towns in the area, becoming the kind of first amongst equals in that group. And during this time, we see a series of heroes from Heratius Cocles to Mucius Scaevola to Cincinnatus and to uh, Marcus Manlius who play a, a kind of a key role in, in some of the big wars that's go, that are going on at the time, but they play an even bigger role in trying to establish what it means to be a good Roman. And that's why we call them the Legends of the Early Republic.